How do you step in after such a song like that? He demands my life, my all, even my death if necessary. Dying to self daily is what the Scripture talks about. (sighs) And someone who dies daily as my partner in life is my bride, Sandy. She is my prayer partner. She is my life partner. She is my encourager. She is my prayer warrior. She is always there with me. And I'm glad she was able to be back today and will be with me over and over and over in this process. We're going to take a look this morning in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Uh, This is the only text in all of the New Testament that deals with the observance of the Lord's Supper within a local body of believers. And unfortunately, there were some things in this body that were not where they needed to be. They needed to be corrected, and Paul had the courage to do that. And so we're going to begin in verse 17 in just a moment. But let me begin here and simply say, I love Africa. If you've... If you've never been to Africa, I hope someday God calls you to go, even on a short-term trip, to go, to get in a village, to be able to be with them. They, they have this thing that they do. They eat together. All the time. When mealtime comes, and I left it in the car, but it's about this big around, there's something called a common bowl. And a common bowl, it's about that thick and about that big around, And they will fill it with rice, because rice, they get all the rice no place else in the world wants. They get that grade, and they bring it in. Or they will have millet. They grow millet, and they will put that in there. On top of it, if they have vegetables, if it's a good year, there might be some cabbage. There might be potato. There might be carrot. There will be some things, some root, and things like that are there. If it's really a good time, they might sacrifice a goat, kill it cook it, fish, put it on that rice, and they sit it down on a mat. They roll a mat out because the ground's considered to be evil and the evil spirits because their mind is constantly thinking about fear power. There are the spirits. There are the demons. They believe in them. They have their marabou, their witch doctors. And so they roll a mat out in order to sit on so they don't touch the ground and somehow contract an evil spirit. They don't eat with their left hand because the left hand is considered to be evil. It's really unsanitary, but they say it's evil. So if you're left-handed, you will have a hard time. You come and you gather around this big bowl. You sit on the ground. Your feet are behind you. Your left hand is behind you. You're best to sit on your left hand. And you're going to eat with just your right hand. Yes, your hand. No fork, no spoon, nothing like that. Everything's on here. And people are going to be sitting around this one, and then they will have another one, and then they'll have another one, because everybody's going to be here together because you eat as community together. It's a part of what you do. And there's, there's a reason for that. Community is everything. It, it really is. <laughs> In an African village, community is everything. You depend upon everyone for everything. If you're a mother, you're a mother to every child in the village. Kind of like growing up in DeSoto. But you would sit there and you would be eating. And I'm going to pick on Johnny, okay? It's to say Johnny is sitting next to me and I'm here and something has happened. Something has happened since the last meal to where... There's something between Johnny and myself. It's it's friction. It's wrong. Something's wrong. Here's how we deal with it. We're eating there. Everything's fine. I'm positioned by Johnny, and, and I have my pie, so to speak, 
in this bowl. It comes to the point in the middle, out to the side, it's there. Johnny has the same thing. Everybody else has that around there. So within their culture, what they end up doing is sitting there eating. We're eating. Everything's there. If I need something, I don't reach across somebody. They, I nod to them. They toss a carrot. They break a potato and toss some potato to me or some meat or whatever. We're doing all of this. But we get to the bottom, and, and, and the reality, here's the thing. Their intention is to make sure there's not a wall of rice left between you and the person sitting on your right or to your left. Because if there's a wall left, let's just say Johnny comes over, but I leave a wall. I eat over to it, but I leave a sliver of wall there that says to everybody in the village they're eating, Oh, there's something between Johnny and Rick. And all of a sudden, the entire community sees this and knows this. Why did they do that? Because there must be unity in their village. And so the entire community gets in on helping us resolve the issue. I, I would ask Do Cortal, he was my career evangelist when I was there, we would sit on the mat and I would just say, just suppose there's a wall. How does this process resolve itself? How does it make it right? And he said, here's what we do. The lords of the house, that is of every family in the village, they come, they sit on the mats in a big circle. And Johnny would be on one side and I would be on the other side. And conversation would be going on because that's what they do. And in that process, when that conversation goes on, at some point, if I have offended Johnny, or in this case, Johnny offended me, what? You know Johnny? Johnny would get on his hands and knees, crawl on his hands and knees across the mat to where I was sitting. In the meantime, all the elders of the village would be saying, look how humble he is. He must be so sorry for what happened. Anybody would forgive him. And the moment comes when he's right before me and he bows his head to the ground before me sitting there. And he confesses what he's done. Everybody's heard it. I have the responsibility to reach down, grab his chin, and lift his head and say, there is nothing to forgive. And harmony is restored within the village. That's a pagan society. That's a fear power worldview. That is not a Christian custom. Oh, but, but there is. In the text, we're going to see a situation where the Apostle Paul is working with the church at Corinth and he's attempting to deal with some things that weren't quite copacetic, weren't quite right within the community of believers in this community in Corinth of Christians. Now, let, let's get a little context here before, before I read this. The context immediately is in Corinth, they had this love feast beginning in verse 17 where they would come together. They, uh, some of them would, would sit together. They would bring their food. They would eat. They would laugh. They would drink. And poor people would come in and they didn't have anything. And divisions were forming among them within the body of Christ. That's the immediate context of coming to observe the Lord's Supper. That's the immediate context. The larger context of 1 Corinthians overall, you know, by beginning, the Apostle Paul had to say, Who's Paul? Who's Apollos? I planted Apollos' water. God gave the increase, so neither is he who plants nor he who waters is the big deal. 
But it's God, he's the one who gives the increase. Some of them were saying, Paul had been there first, so some were surrounding themselves with Paul, said, I'm a Paul. After Paul left and went to Ephesus, uh, Aquila and Priscilla went with him. They found Apollos as Paul walked on, and they trained Apollos more fully in the way Apollos came to Corinth, and he was an eloquent apologist in, in the Scriptures, the Old Testament Scriptures, and so many of them began following Apollos. So they would say, I'm of Apollos, so I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos. Cephas got in there somehow. Peter got in there somehow, and some were saying, I am of Peter, I'm of Cephas. And some had the audacity to say, I'm of Christ. And so they were forming divisions between themselves all along. And there were issues. Paul had to tell them, you know, God didn't call very many wise, but the foolish things of the world. He had to tell them, knowledge puffs up. You think you know something? You really don't. The bigger context, dealing with those things of divisions among this, what was a pagan society in Corinth. Paul came, shared the gospel, had a mass. He was there after he went to, he went to Macedonia, to Philippi, he went to Thessalonica, he went to Berea, he went over to Athens, he came over to Corinth. He was at Corinth for about two years. He was established. He tells them at the end of 2 Corinthians in chapter 11 that who does not fall into sin that I do not inwardly burn? He loved this people. Paul was not coming in saying, you just mess up. and That's not what Paul was doing. Paul loved these believers. And he knew God loved them. And there were some things he wanted them to know. So, so that's Corinth. If, if I spread out and take the larger context, let's, let's go back all the way to the Lord's Supper, when there was the Passover. In John chapter 13, Jesus, uh, we, we take it, they began the Passover feast, the process. In the end, he took it after Judas was gone and turned it into what we're going to celebrate here. But in the midst of taking that Passover supper, what did Jesus do? Jesus took his outer garment off. He took a towel, wrapped it about himself, and took a basin of water and a pitcher pitcher of water and a basin. And he went and he began to wash all of their feet. You know, Peter was like, <laughs> but it took place. He washed their feet. When he was done, he sat the pitcher and bowl aside, took the towel off, put his robe back on, went and took his place. He said, if you know what I've just done, blessed are you if you will do it also. He said, in that upper room, this is how everyone is going to know that you're my disciples. And that you have love one for another. Not fussing, not feuding, not siding, taking sides. It was about unity with Christ's kingdom. Scripture tells us he's the head. We're cells in the body. Any giftedness we have, we can't brag about that giftedness because chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians verse 11 says, the Spirit of God has given severally about these spiritual gifts to each one of you as he wills, not as I will or desire. It's up to him. Verse 18 in chapter 12 says, God placed the members in the body just as it pleased Him. So whatever my giftedness is and wherever I'm placed within the body, it's because God did that. It's not because I earned it. It's because of something God has done. So how can I brag about something that I've had nothing to do with? It's simply what God has chosen to do, and how God chose to draw me out of miry clay and claim me for Himself, and on a certain day, He drew me to Himself. 
And so, so everything within the body of Christ, like that pagan village who understood, we have to be together. Everything about this church at Corinth was separated. It was fractured, right? That, that's what it was. It was just there were a lot of these relationships that were fractured and people getting their get, getting hurt and, and pushed aside and put down and some. In, in chapter 11, verse 17, it, it begins like this. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you. Because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. Verse 19, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. I think that's a little bit of tongue-in-cheek. Not totally. Verse 20, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead on his own meal, has his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat in and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you to this? No, I will not. Again, knowing the Apostle Paul and what he writes at the end of chapter 11 in 2 Corinthians, we we understand he wasn't somebody just ready to pounce on them. His heart is broken over this brokenness within the body. And so there was was some things going on. And what we would call this in 17 down through uh, verse uh, 22 is, this is reproof, right? And when Paul was writing Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 16, he says, all scripture is breathed out by God. It's inspired by God. It is profitable for doctrine or teaching for reproof for correcting, for instruction in righteousness, the man of God may be completely furnished into all good works. So this, this, this is the process. This is not the doctrine. This is the reproof. Reproof is simply saying, you're wrong. You, got, you guys, you got this wrong. Now, he's been gone from there. He went there in 50 Around 50 A.D., this, this is somewhere, he left around 52, this is somewhere around 54 that he's heard about this, and he's had these years together with them, even from a distance, and, and he, he loves them, he wants something right, some things have happened in their life, and so he is, he is lovingly confronting them and telling them, This is not right. Now, the passage just before this, in the beginning, he says, I praise you for this. And so it wasn't that he just, you know, it's always good if you're going to tell somebody something's wrong, tell them something's right first. That's just a good practice. If there's something right, talk about it. He did. He's answering questions that came from some individuals from Corinth who came to visit him. And so so here he tells them, this, I'm glad. I praise you in this. I can't praise you in this. This This is a reproof. And then he turns around and he gives them, uh, we might say doctrine, we might say a correction. Okay, This this is what you're doing. This is not the Lord's Supper. He tells them, this is not the Lord's Supper that you are doing. It doesn't even resemble it. So now he's going to reflect on what he heard Jesus, this is what it says in verse 23, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. In other words, he's saying, in the wording he's using, he's saying, the Lord Jesus gave this directly to me. Now, if you know the Apostle Paul, he 
He wasn't with the disciples walking around with Jesus. He was saved on his way to Damascus to throw those believers into prison and even have some put to death. He was saved later. He talks about going into Arabia, being taught by Jesus, not by the apostles. Perhaps, perhaps it took place during that time. But he's saying, this is what I received from the Lord Jesus personally. And so he says, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. In other words, I have, I have already instructed you about this, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup. After supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So it's not that he just said, you're wrong. He's saying, here's the right way to do this. Here's, here's, here's this whole mentality. Here's this whole process. And, and I've been through a lot of Lord's Supper process in my years as a pastor. And too many of them are just, just, oh, we get looking introspectively and, and we begin, it seems to be sad, but here it says you do show this until when? Until the Lord comes. In other words, there's an element, every time I take the Lord's Supper, I'm declaring He's going to return. And I'm waiting for that, and I'm looking for that. The Apostle Paul had shared that with them. And so, so he's telling them, here is, the, here is the, the process of the correcting, using the word from God for them. This is how we're going to observe the Lord's Supper. It's going to be the bread. It's His body. It's for you. God the Father sent God the Son to become flesh. He who knew no sin became sin for, I like to personalize it. Yes, it's for us, but he became sin for me. Every thought, every foul word, Every possible sin you can think of, every act of anger, murder, jealousy, strife, contention, he didn't just remove it, he became it. He became that adulterer, he became that murderer. He became that liar. He became that cheater. He became that arrogant, egotistic personality. He became every possible, imaginable sin. He became sin for me. What did he do? He took me out of the kingdom of darkness and he transported me into the kingdom of light. He says, you once were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. There is that change that takes place in an individual's life. That change, his body was there on the cross with the beating on his back. That whole process taking the punishment for my sin. The sin that sows, it shall Die, the scripture says in Ezekiel. This God, God says, do I find any pleasure in that one soul die? It's a rhetorical question he asks in Ezekiel. The answer is no. He finds no pleasure that anyone would die. And the word die means to be separated from God for all of eternity. That is not God's desire. His desire is that none, none perish. And so he sent Jesus to die, not just for those who one day will be saved, but for all. 
even those who through life and forever end up not turning to him. He became sin for us. In order that we might be made the righteousness of God. Christ was the righteousness, the perfection, the ultimate. He became, I became the righteous. He took my sin and he gave me his righteousness. He learned obedience, Philippians tells us. Even to death, death on the cross for me. He took on himself the form of man. And, and so here, here it is. He, he gives them the, the correction here in this process. Here's, here's what it's supposed to be. But then he deals with this in verse 27. And this is the instruction in righteousness that the man of God might be thoroughly furnished to all good works. Here's what it says in verse 27. Whoever, therefore, since, since this is what it's all about, whoever, anybody here a whoever? Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner uh, will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. I, I, I think... Every Lord's Day, they took the Lord's Supper. Acts chapter 2, 42 and following, they addicted themselves to the apostles' doctrine to the breaking of bread. But th this was something that they were doing. They continued from house to house and in the temple. They, they were doing that sometimes on a daily basis. This Unity within the body of Christ was absolutely everything to Jesus. He's the head, we are the body. We might be in the foot, we might be in the hand, we might be in the ear, we might be in the eye, we might be in the mouth, we might be in the tongue, but we are members in the body of Christ. And I am not every member in the body of Christ, and I better not think that I am. And so, so here's the process. He, he says, if I do it in an unworthy manner, what, what does that mean? Within context, trying to stay within context, the immediate context, there were all these divisions, and they were coming with these divisions, not writing them, and then taking the Lord's Supper not recognizing this is what he wants. This is possible because of this. To take it in a worthy manner has nothing to do with whether I'm worthy. Let's answer that question. I'm not worthy. It has everything to do with when I come here, the Spirit of God has said, Rick, so-and-so has ought against you. Rick, you have ought against so-and-so. Remember in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talked about that, right? He said, if you come to the altar and there remember that your brother has ought against you, leave your offering there, go, be made right with your brother, come back, then your offering will be received from you. Later on in the Gospel of Matthew, not in the Sermon on the Mount, but later on, it has to deal with you come to the place to where you realize you have ought against somebody. You're the one who needs to go to them. Whether they have ought against you or you have ought against them, the responsibility is always on you, me. I am not to wait for somebody to come say, Rick, I'm sorry, please forgive me. If I know there's something there that then God says, it's my responsibility as a cell within his body, as the red blood cells and the white blood cells come together to give health and strength and to fight the infection. It's my, response, it's my personal responsibility to go to that member of the body to bring health and healing in that process. That, that's why I love the Lord's Supper, if we will take the time to make things right. If there are things that 
need to be made right. So he says, whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty. The word guilty is a word that declares that I will be judged. I will be condemned. Not lost. But I deserve the torturing. R- remember, I- I'm thinking it's Matthew 25 off the top of my head. Uh, there's the man who owed his master. Whew, right? And, and is way more than he could ever pay. And his master, when he pleaded, forgave him everything. And then he goes out and finds his fellow servant who just is indebted to him a little bit. He wants him, grabs him by the throat, the collar, and wants to make him pay. The guy can't, so he has him thrown in prison until he can pay everything. Jesus' response in that story is that this is what your father will do to every one of you who will not forgive your brother from the heart. He's placed in prison. And that's bitterness, guilt, placed in that torturous process of of embittered spirit until he can pay everything he owes. Well, everything had been forgiven, right? So now, but what he owes is to that guy he didn't forgive. He owes him forgiveness. And until he can do that, he's going to be in that embittered spirit. So, so here, here he goes. He is guilty concerning the body and the blood of Christ. Why? Because we are the body. We are the shed blood. 28, let a person examine himself. Aren't you glad it says that? not my role to examine you. That's not my responsibility. Even the pagan African culture understood it wasn't their job to find out and judge Johnny. It was Johnny's role to come clean with this for the sake of the whole village, the whole group. It's not my role, it's not Colton's role, it's not Gene's role, it wasn't Jeremy's role, it wasn't Rick Ferguson's role to pinpoint somebody's heart. And I'm not God. But one thing I do know is God knows my heart. Jeremiah writes it this way. The heart is desperately wicked, deceitful above all things. Who can know the heart? Chapter 17, verse 10, that was 9, verse 10 says, I, the Lord, know the heart. So this morning as we gather here, he knows every one of our hearts. He knows absolutely every aspect of it. He knows, is there an issue? It might be between husband and wife. It might be between dad and kids, mom and kids, kids and kids. It might be between me and my neighbor. It might be between me and my boss at work. Relationships, it's about unity. That's what the Lord's Supper, it keeps bringing us back to we are one. We are one. We are healthy. We are whole. Christ is the head, and we are all within this body. Verse 29, for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning, that is the same word as examine, without discerning, judging, without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. So if I don't take the time to go through and say, God, my heart, my thoughts, it's got this in my heart toward my brother. That don't make you go to hell. You're a believer. You're saved. He forgave that sin. It's talking about unity within the body of Christ because by this shall all men know that we are his disciples and that we have loved one for another. And I just have a hard time loving somebody that I 
have ought against. Right? That, that's, that's just the reality. Discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Verse 30, that is why many of you are, isn't this a tough verse? That's why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. I, at least I'm glad the, the ESV put that instead of asleep. Because that's what it's talking about. Some of you are spiritually weak. Some of you are spiritually sick. Some among you, he's telling them, have even lost their life. They went to a point to where God says, come on home. It stops their heartbeat. They would not make right something. Because here, here's the process. God would much rather us come before him broken and under his power humbly go to one another and make things right. Because if we judge ourselves, we'll not be judged. Uh, this is what this goes ahead and says. But if we judge, verse 31, ourselves, truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Chapter 12 of Hebrews, he talks about being disciplined, right? Which one having a son doesn't discipline his son? If you're without discipline in your life, it's because you're illegitimate and not mine. If you can do things, that you can identify this is wrong, this is wrong according to God's word. If I just did the Ten Commandments, this is wrong, this is wrong, I covet this, I, um, I have taken the Lord's name in vain, I have broken the Sabbath, I have, I have, I have, I have, I have. And we'd all have to look at it and say, at some point, we're all there but Jesus. But what he wants to do, he, he's, trying to, he's trying to raise us into adult followers of his, mature followers, who can look at that and say, I don't need you, Father, to go. I don't need you to go with the scourge. I don't need you to take my life early. This is wrong in my life. And I want to make it right. Do you understand that passage? It is all about unity within the body of Christ. Today, on the Jewish calendar, it's the 10th day of the first month of their year. It's the day that every good Jew selects for their family a lamb. It can come from the sheep or it can come from the goats, but it must be unblemished. And they keep it up. And on the 14th day, they will sacrifice that lamb. They will roast it. They will eat it. They will celebrate the Passover. Guess when Passover is? This coming Friday? Which actually starts at 6 p.m. on Thursday night and goes to 6 p.m. on Friday. Jesus comes in on what we call Palm Sunday when they were singing and praising and yet he came in as the chosen lamb of God to be sacrificed, processed, betrayed, denied, gone be before the court system, everything by 9 a.m., he was being hanged on the cross. Hanging there saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Saying, into your hands, I commit my spirit. His life was gone. 
but he rose again. Right? And that's what next week's about. He, he rose again. But this week, this Passover week, he celebrated on Thursday, Passover, with his disciples. We're doing that today. But before we do, here's the invitation. Number one and always. If you're here and God has been doing something in your life and he's, he just, he's drawing you to himself, you can't come to him unless he's drawing you to himself. That's the sovereignty of God. That he's been working within your life. There have been a period of times, period of things. You've heard it over and over and over and over. But, but being religious isn't knowing Christ. And that's a result of knowing Christ. But you can be religious without knowing Christ. You can be religious about a lot of things. But if God, by His Spirit, is wooing you to Himself, and that conviction is coming in your heart, and you're at the place like I was the second Tuesday night of January 1978, all of a sudden, it dawns on you. I'm lost. I need to be saved. Today's the day. I think that's scripture too. Today is the day of salvation. If today you sense the Spirit of God drawing you, say yes to Him. There will be there will be those up here. If you're a lady, a lady will see you. If you're a man, men will see you. But the beginning of the invitation is simply this. If you need to be saved, today's a great day. Today's a great day. We invite you. Uh, the, the, the other side is simply this. We're, we're about to take this. If you need to come and kneel at this altar, stand at this altar, someone will move from the front chair if you would rather kneel at a front chair, sit in the front chair, stand before God's altar. And you need to say, God, I, I know, even, even while we've been talking here this morning, God, I, I know you've been pinpointing and prodding my heart. This thing in my life is wrong. It's in relation and I'm at odds with you don't have to tell me. Just tell God. God already knows, right? God already knows. Tell Him. Make that right with Him. If the person's here, what a wonderful thing to do to go to say, I have sinned against you. Please forgive me. You know what they're going to do? I think arms are going to go around one another. There's going to be great joy. So he says, wait for one another. And I want to say this. If God breaks out and does something like that in us, teachers who prepared your Sunday school lesson, chill. Because this is business before God. Not that Sunday school class is not. But let God be God and work in our midst. But when there's no more movement during the invitation time, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Okay? So James, you and your crew, thank you.